All right. Right. Um, my stand over here, is that okay? I can remove the stand. This one. You can stand wherever you want. Excellent. Hello. Uh, do I have Dave Cooper? Just a little about me. There is nothing on the that slide that's really that important, apart from this last point from the bottom, which I've kind of always referred to. Um, and that's the I don't claim to be any smarter than anybody else, right? I, I just happen to be happy standing up, speaking in front of a room for the people. I got here by starting out by talking, uh, you know, doing small nightly talks and like that. I would encourage you all to speak. Um, you all have something worth saying. The trouble is most of you think you don't because you're here and the people you talk to are the same things you do. They, they will do because you talk to them all the time. But other people don't, they want to hear what you have to say. Um, it's really great to help you organise your own thoughts and um, build you a confidence about what you're talking about. And I would encourage you all to speak to less if needed and more of you And um, if you have something to, to speak about, just let me know. I'll put you on. So. I work here. You don't really care about the fact that I work at Huddle. Apart from the fact that Huddle is a software company in software, I'm not a consultant. I have nothing to sell you. Um, uh, we'll talk about number three. We'll talk about what we mean, what we mean by availability, what is that, can we define it? We'll talk about some tactics that you can use to ensure availability. And we'll talk really about a big topic called uh, thought recovery. So thought recovery is kind of what you're being most interested in trying to understand. And that's what we've got to talk about things like planning out, retry, circuit projects. The first thing is, what is availability? What do we mean to say something is available? Right. Let's start a little bit earlier and talk about what we mean by fault. A fault is pretty simply defined as something going wrong. And um, a bug is the fault that we most understand. Right, you get an error report from somebody, you say, you the bug in the software, and I do this, this, and this, the problem breaks. Um, but uh, maybe also some that poor performance. It could be simply that when I load this page, it takes 30 seconds to actually load. Right. So it's another thing where we really say the software is not behaving correctly. And an error is when that fault causes us to deviate from the specification of the right. So we're saying, well, actually, you know, the 10 seconds number, that's fine, because we actually, we accept that this thing will basically take 10 seconds to load, and we've got a nice thing going that up, and that's all fine. Right? And we may say, that way outside the bounds of what we agree to the customer, that's definitely an error. Usually, it's a yellow screen of death or something, it tends to mean the application crashes, we tend to accept that's actually you know, error. So those kind of exceptions we get thrown and not handled are obviously uh, errors. But we need to keep on saying that any exception you throw is probably a fault. If you catch it, it probably may not become an error. Normal faults, normal faults are quite important to understand. Um, sometimes we find that something is only a fault under certain conditions low concurrency more people in the system at any one time. So, you know, it's very common to find these things high until you actually meet the error condition. It's one of the ones, you know, that we have spent a long time testing for quite often is multi-user problems when there are multiple users actually working on something at the same time. And you have hundreds of people bashing away, you can't find an error, and then essentially it goes into production and you know, lo and behold you get some concurrency. Right, and those are all important. The, the current load as well is quite important. Right? So the system works fine when we're testing it. We have two tests of logging. So it turns out when a thousand customers log in, it's a problem. Well, it turns out that when customers request their order history and they've got a hundred items, that works fine. Or when customers request their order history, there are a hundred thousand items, our software breaks. We didn't anticipate that being a requirement. 
some kind of one to many relationship with an LRM, who went away and loaded all the child records in there. Um, the failure is when that deviation from the classification of the system becomes observable in some way. That somebody somewhere has, has noticed that something has gone wrong and they are probably complaining to our support team right now as we speak. Saying, I can't get in and do my work and ruin my life, you bunch of amateurs. You know, uh, so, 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 the not all errors are tables, because in some cases you can mitigate that, that fact, right? And what works quite well is how you mitigate some errors so that they're less of an observable to users or at least a greater functionality that they can use based on a less aware of what's happening. So, the classic case with that might be we serve results from cache, we can't get the data. Users may not be aware that they missed their looking at that all. Tonight's show on Netflix are actually an hour old. Um, you've missing a couple of the episodes that have been released, but you may never realize, right? But you mitigate them in some hours to that time. So, the future definition of availability is that the system is not in failure. So, you could have faults, you could have some errors. Provided you're essentially providing service to the users, you are definitely available. And so the, the, the availability of the system is able to mask errors such that effectively you continue to look for the user as well as the one This is a usual measure of like all heard of this key measures. We have quite like a lot, like two nines, three nines, four nines, and that tells simply what we're up. So the availability is better as a percentage of the time you're up, and that equates to these kind of numbers basically a year or basically a day. Usually the downtime is measured over a month or a quarter in terms of basically an agreement with a customer. What I do this one, I think it's 9.9 probably That's what essentially the standard is for an AWS utility service. Running one of those at the time. That means it offers that available that up. a pretty good number for a kind of SaaS business to kind of target. Four nines is, is hard work. Um, generally because you get irritating things like uh, we, we lose time for not things that are outside our control. So we have a data center. Um, I'm not going to name names, but Carpathia, which is a US company, which also used to ho hosted kid.com. And uh, uh, they were changing a light fitting, or a, a, a contractor, as the Americans would say. In other words, an electrician they'd hired came in and said, I don't want to be electrocuted. I better basically turn off, essentially, the electricity at the fuse. Uh, threw the wrong switch and turned off power to the entire data center, and thus essentially preventing our software from doing anything very useful. Um, uh, and that's kind of outside your control. He was found an hour later by security hiding in a cupboard. obviously kind of aware of quite what he'd done. So it's really hard to get this because you have to have so much under your control to actually achieve that kind of uptime. Right, so how do we improve our availability? Did, 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 you, did the Norwegians get Animal Farm or is that, no, it's not something you have in your kind of school? Is that, oh, you do, okay. Um, prevention, detection and recovery. So what we really care about is tr how, do we, how do we stop faults happening in the first place, right? What can we do to, to, to be less, less faulty? When they do occur, how do we detect them? If we de and then how do we recover from them once we've noticed them, right? So the three main steps. So 
The first step really on the road to health is just good practices in terms of the way you write code, right? And a list of things that you might put under the generalized heading of software craftsmanship. So let's do some TDD. Uh, let's pair because then we get two eyes on it. If we don't feel like pairing because we're uncomfortable with that model, let's be side by side and have some code reviews instead, right? Um, let's make sure we test, right? So as well as just basically the developer tests running, let's actually have some automated tests run by QAs or some exploratory testing. Because some things like multi you know, concurrency errors and multiple users are actually quite hard to flush out with just developer tests or even automated tests can struggle a little bit, right? So some, we want to flush some of those things out. Um, random behavior that essentially um, generates errors in the system. Um, those all will help us catch defects in the SDLC. Training, right? So you've talked about the kind of things we're about to talk about today. You can essentially help people fix availability errors. But the reality everyone has to face uh, nowadays is that faults will escape that process, um, particularly dormant faults. So the, the issue with dormant faults is that, you know, um, essentially you quite often don't run your system in a, a, a QA environment in the same load characteristics or environment that you will run in a production environment. And therefore, dormant faults will tend to sneak into the process. Okay. So, um, generally speaking, nowadays, in distributed systems, we've come to accept that there is very little chance of us mitigate, uh, removing all errors from the process. There's this notion that faults will occur at some point or other. So what are you going to do about the fact that you need to accept that? Um, this one is stealth mode faults. So there are some additional things in case you don't know that you can do to basically capture these dormant faults. And as we said before, generally they come from issues like concurrency, from data growth, from resource leaks, all right? So there are generally standard tactics. Multi-user testing helps you flush out concurrency issues. Um, SOAP testing, when you run your software, basically you know, the test environments over a long weekend, for example, and check before and after to see whether you've been leaking any resources. And load testing, where essentially you look at putting lots of load in the system. Those things will all help flush out results. Okay, but even so, faults happen, right? So, if things escape, you, you, uh, you basically faults are going to happen. You know, the next thing you need to do is detect them. So, a lot of effort goes into the idea of saying, well, I need to be notified about faults when they occur so I can determine the, the health of my system. Okay? And what you really need to do is have a program where you think about how you're doing your monitoring. So, the basic level is kind of logging and obviously logging out errors. And if you have a distributed system, obviously you need to think about logging with something like the ELT stack because you don't want to be hunting through lots of individual log files located on various servers. You want to centrally collate those and then be able to effectively query those logs to determine what's happening. Okay. Beyond logging, there are more uh, intrusive forms of monitoring. So you can check things like memory usage and see whether your machine's running out of memory. You can check things like disk usage. You can check things like queues. So if you're using something like RabbitMQ, for example, as a broker, you can check QNs. You can see that queues are basically going down at a reasonable rate for jobs that work to be in process to check that nothing has stalled, for example. You can check the database. You can look for things like um, head blockers, which mean that essentially nothing else is being processed while something's being deadlocked. There's a huge amount of monitoring you can do. And generally what you're looking for is the system beginning to behave out of its normal characteristic envelope so that you can begin to suspect that an error is occurring and you may need to essentially mitigate it. Okay. Um, there's a whole range of tools called application performance management tools. And these essentially look at um, giving you a kind of dashboard view of your system. So classic examples of things like Nagios and New Relic. Any of you use those? Okay. Uh, these basically plug into your, your system and essentially provide you a large amount of data about what's happening. Typically, what happens is they give you monitoring information on any of your servers, on the application runtime itself, and then you can set up information around key business transactions, i.e. key journeys the user makes, and you can determine whether or not, essentially, they are performing with what's called, called an AppDeck score, usually. So that says, 
Um, I set some limits for how fast this should happen, et cetera, and then I report issues which basically come outside that score. And generally, you'll get alerts popping up saying, you know, this particular transaction is essentially running much too slow. Um, and then you can go out and investigate. The application performance monitoring tool will often give you an indication of a timeline. You can say, give me the information in the last three hours. You get the spikes in the graph, et cetera. So we may, for example, get alerts at Huddle when um, we get particular unusual heavy, heavy traffic. Someone starts uploading piles of video to the site. We may see alerts as basically parts of the system start to struggle under the load. And then you can react by introducing capacity, for example, into the system in order to cope with that temporary load. Okay. That's application performance monitoring. Um, so if you can't eliminate your faults, then what you need to do generally is provide yourself with protection when those faults do begin to occur. Right? And so if I detect things, do I have the ability to actually then deal with the issues? And what we're really concerned about is to prevent propagation from one part of the system to another such that effectively you get failure which is visible to the user. Okay. So particularly in distributed environments, it's quite possible for one component to begin to behave in an aberrant fashion, but us to simply use other capacity to replace that or to essentially cope in the cooler by serving results from a cache, for example, and prevent failure. And this is what we're going to talk about mostly is what are these patterns you can use to achieve this kind of level of resilience in the event of failure? And what you're seeking most of all to prevent is what's called a cascade failure. So imagine we have a system which is basically system which has components A and component system A and system B, and B depends on A. I have to do this right, right way around because I always forget which way I've, sa I've said it. So B is depending on A, right? And a fault occurs in A. And that fault is unhandled. So we throw an exception because, for example, a sequence is empty and we didn't expect it to be. Throw that exception effectively, and the fault becomes an error because it bubbles out. Right? And that, the, the system itself then, then says, well, I, I don't have any way of coping with this, and it fails to respond to the caller. Okay? So B has called A in a reasonable expectation that A will succeed, and now it's throwing back an error. So if it's basically making an HTTP request, for example, you're hoping for 200 OK back, but actually I'm giving you back 503 internal server error. Okay. So system B now has a fault, and its fault is that system A is not behaving as it expects to. Okay. The problem becomes if in system B we have not written our code to anticipate that that call to system A could result in an error, I of 503, and we get no results. And it simply then fails in turn. We have a, we have a new fault. Uh, that fault turns into basically a error on system B because it says, I don't know how to cope when the system fails. And it then propagates out by failing itself. And that can go all the way up your chain. That's basically a cascade failure. Okay, everyone kind of got that? So most of the patterns we're going to talk about are really focused on preventing cascade failure. Okay, so at this point, Anyone flying on a plane tomorrow? If you're flying on a plane tomorrow, you might want to basically go to the toilet for two minutes while we talk about this. Uh, so I'll talk about an example from uh, outside of computing because it's a really good way of illustrating um, the cascade failure. So a DC-10 in 1989 crashed in the Sioux City, Iowa, and what happened was the fan in one of its engines developed a hairline crack. And that crack, essentially, under stress of the engine being in use, effectively uh, caused the fan to disintegrate explosively. And as the fan at high speed effectively tore itself to shreds, it threw fragments of fan through the rest of the aircraft. Now back in 1989, some of you may be young enough that essentially you don't really remember 1989, um, the aircraft didn't fly by wire, they flew on hydraulics. They used fluid basically between the controls and the control surfaces and these hydraulic lines were severed by fragments moving at high speed. That meant that the air crew lost control of the control surfaces of the aircraft, right? So they couldn't use the flaps and the rudders anymore to steer the aircraft. So their only option in order to um, uh, deal with the aircraft was essentially to throttle the two engines so that they could vary the speed in order to help them steer the aircraft. I'm gonna play a video. We, we go, is that gonna work for you? Okay. I got to turn up my sound. Uh, I don't know whether you better hear it all, but we can. <laughs> 
oh, I don't have any sound coming out. Never mind. We'll see what happens. Um, that's a, just a ground alarm going off. The most amazing thing I think about this particular accident is that a large number of people walked away from the accident. And they, uh, first they thought that you know, there were no survivors, and then they discovered that the, most of the survivors were parts of the fuselage that ended up in cornfields, this is Iowa, uh, just beyond, and they came walking out of the corn. Um, they discovered the pilots still alive. Um, the wreckage that the pilot plane in was so twisted and mangled that they just thought it was a lump of metal and two rescuers were actually sitting on this piece of metal taking a break eating their lunch when they heard tapping from inside the piece of metal they were sitting on where the pilots were actually trapped. Um, so 111 died and 185 survived which when you consider the seriousness of the accident. The guy called Captain Al Haynes who was the guy flying the aircraft became a hero. They essentially tried to simulate what he'd done basically throttling the, en the engines on the aircraft to land the plane again and no one could successfully land the plane in the simulator. They always crashed short of the runway. Um, so for that reason, it's become known as the impossible landing. This guy is Lieutenant Colonel David Nielsen. He was a National Guardsman on duty that day, and he's carrying basically this child away. Um, and this photograph went around the world. There's a statue uh, now basically in Iowa, basically of this image. And uh, people didn't really understand what had happened. But the next day, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Nielsen went to visit the um, hospital where this child was to speak to him and a reporter shouted out, uh, you saved that child. And he replied, no sir, God saved him, I just carried him. So there you go, that's cascade failure for you. Even I'm flying, anyway. Um, but the good news is, right, people survive in quite large numbers, crashes like that. Okay, talk about fault recovery. The most basic pattern in fault recovery is the timeout. Okay? The idea is that if I essentially call from one process to another, I am generally going to be using resources on the cooler while I wait for the coolie. Eventually, I will run out of resources. This is true even if I am using some kind of async process to do that. I effectively do have resources tied up in the cool, essentially. So eventually, I will run out of resources. Eventually, I'll run out of resources and I will fail. Okay. So, imagine that my system is set up as follows. I have, this is my user. It's essentially a front end, takes an HTTP request, some kind of web server. It's calling some kind of microservice on the back end, probably via HTTP in this particular example, um, or the TCP IP or any other kind of like um, uh, synchronous call would work. And it talks to the database to get results back. So imagine that essentially when I'm calling a database, I have a number of long running queries going on. And as a result, there are no connections left in the connection pool for the microservice, so to speak. Has anyone ever had this? Okay, so occasionally you can run out of connections in the connection pool. Okay, the problem is that um, if I don't do anything about this, then what happens is I will begin to run out of threads on this service, which essentially is now waiting effectively for the resource pool to come free. Okay. And so what can tend to happen is this becomes starved and this basically stops receiving any new requests from the first service. Oops, why am I not? There we go. Um, you then tend to find what happens is, is that your web server, you got incoming requests coming from your customers still, begins to essentially say, well, I can't actually make any calls out to these service anymore, I'm blocked from doing that. It's basically, I'm now waiting for it because it's constantly telling me it's waiting still, all right? So eventually what happens is it begins to queue requests. And after a certain limit, your web server will tend to say, I can't queue any more requests. I'm gonna tell the users that basically I am broken and down, all right? So this guy, this guy waiting here, effectively and never actually giving up, causes this guy waiting here to never give up causes your server to actually run out basically of capacity and your users see an error, okay? And it's easily fixable. I just time out, right? I time out when essentially I am waiting to get database connection and I say give up after a certain amount of time, effectively. And if I time out and I get a lot of timeouts, what I can do is actually signal to my users that I'm under load 
give them a 49 too many requests, and ask them to back off. Okay. Or enhance your calm, I think Flickr tells you. Um, uh, it's a very simple pr uh, fix to the problem. Okay. Anytime you're really making a call between one process and another, you should time out. Okay. And one of the problems with some older frameworks is that their timeouts are ridiculous. By default, they're kind of like two minutes. Uh, two minutes is an eternity <laughs> in modern computing. You know, your, your timeout should be something like you know, 500 milliseconds or something, not, not two minutes of sitting there going, gee, no one seems to be replying. I wonder how long this operation takes. Okay. Um, so have a reasonably spaced timeout. Oops, okay. Who, does anyone want to play? Let's play some, with some balls. Come on. Can I, can I just get, let's have you three, right? Come on, up the front. You've all had a beer, at least, at least two of you have, so that should give you, some, give you some courage. All you have to do is throw in and catch balls. So we just demonstrate this. So the reason we do this is because teaching things in different ways helps. Form a line in front of me. Ready? You are going to be our web server. Step forward a bit, sir. You are going to be our microservice. Congratulations. You're going to be our database. So we're just going to practice. I'm going to throw the ball to you. You just throw the ball to him. You just throw the ball. And, you, and we just all go, go all the way back. Very simple. Don't worry if you can't catch. That is just a fault. We, know how to, we are dealing with those. You can pass the ball back database server. You can respond to the request. Database, you can throw them back. No, nope. re respond via the guy in the middle. That's it. Well done. Okay, and I've dropped the ball just so you know it happens. Okay, so what we're going to show now, first of all, is this guy essentially holding on to all the balls. Essentially, what we want to demonstrate is that you're not responding at all, right? And you'll see, effectively, okay, so when you get, when you get two, actually, just stop when you get two. There you go, sir. Right, now your hands are full, right? So you're not going to respond to any more requests. So when you get it now, hold on to the balls. Okay. He's now full as well. So what's going to happen with this guy, if we have more balls, is essentially he's eventually going to run out of hands and he's going to stop responding. Okay. Now, what I want you to do this time is I just want you to count to like three and then if he and then just start throwing the balls back, right? So the requests come in, the database is effectively going to start filling up. Alarm the database. Okay, he's now, the database is now blocked. He hasn't got any resources left. He's going to count, right? He's going to time out. He's going to say, hang on a minute. And he's going to pass it back to the web server. Two, three, right. So he's timed out and said, hello, I couldn't service that request. So these guys can keep playing, right? Eventually, the database becomes free and he throws his balls back. Great. Oh, fault. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Right. Don't worry, you'll get your turn. Uh, so the reason I do this is because um, uh, it helps to learn things different ways, right? And as they get a bit more complicated, they get more, more kind of interesting. Okay. Retry. So it turns out that a lot of the faults we get are actually transient. Um, uh, we get occasional network errors, right? Which just, just happen. And then you try, if you have try again, 200 milliseconds later, then the, the fault is not there, right? Databases have things like deadlocks, which occur momentarily, and then they're gone. And so the problem with timing out all the time is that essentially, well, I've failed a request for that particular user. Maybe I've given them some results from a cache that are stale. It may be a sensible thing to do at that particular point in time. Well, I've kept the system running for the majority of my users, I may well have given a degraded experience to some user when I could potentially have given them a better scenario. And in this particular case, what we're saying is effectively, rather than basically, we just got a deadlock, right? In the case of a deadlock, maybe we'll try something else. And the answer is to retry. Okay. If we just retried that particular operation at that point in time, then effectively it would flow correctly. All right. Let's have. Come on, you three can come and do balls. Don't worry. We only, we, we, we. Come on. Yes, come on. Come on, come and throw balls. I'm the usually one that drops them, so. Right. So, person in the front, you are a lovely HTTP web server. You are a lovely microservice. And you are a lovely database. 
So what we really want to do is just, first of all, we'll start off by, by just repeating um, the scenario of just some normal progress. So, so you guys get used to it, just throw a ball up and down so you guys can get, get up to speed, keep the threat all the way back. Excellent. You're operating reasonably well. Uh, oops. Okay. Right, so now we're going to do a retry. So all I want you to do, really, is when you've got two balls, you're going to stop receiving requests. And then you, when you come to throw to him, you just want to count, and then eventually just throw a ball back while, while she's still counting, effectively, and then she can throw her ball to you. So just say, you count to three, you throw the ball back, you're freed up. You can get, you, you can get the ball that's coming back to you, and then you can, then he's free to take a new ball. We'll see, watch. So take, you can catch two balls, keep going down. Keep going down, all the way down. All right, the database is now busy, okay? When you come with this one, okay. So you now can't throw to him, but if you count, 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, now you throw the one back, one back, he's freed up, you can throw that green one forward, and can you see essentially the retry means that we are effectively able to keep servicing the requests. Let's do it once more. 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, and then effectively it's free. All right, very simple. Thank you very much, guys. They get more complicated as they go on. <laughs> <laughs> okay, very easy. So, uh, generally, use a retry if you are aware that the fault is transient. Quite often, if you are receiving an exception, you, you may well give, have a really good indication as to whether actually that fault could be, whether you could retry. Um, sometimes, we, you know, we, we code some of our APIs to give you actually a, try, a, a retry, basically, uh, after a uh, header back to say, try again this amount of time. Um, don't retry if you're aware it's not a transient error, right? That's, that's just kind of crazy. Um, also be aware that you need a limit to the number of retries. Generally, you should be guided whatever your quality constraint is for the overall service time of your um, particular call. So we have a rule, for example, that any API call should complete in under 300 milliseconds. And generally, if you're going to push yourself way over that, and you want to think about whether or not essentially you should keep retrying over that period of time. So what do you do if you've got an error and um, that error's not gonna go away for a bit? Okay. So the database server has failed, the cluster manager is busy desperately trying to basically bring up a new database for us, um, but we want to, in the interim, try and avoid the problem of either lots of resources being consumed by us waiting to do timeouts or lots of retries hitting the, trying to hit the database when the database is not, uh, is already suffering. Okay. So let's imagine essentially that we have, again, essentially not enough connections being free from the pool due to long running queries. The last thing we want to do is to keep hitting that database to make it harder. The problem with essentially our model of effectively fixing this whole thing with a timeout is going to be that uh, we're just going to consume resources here for, uh, for the whole period of time, right? And we might just want to say, actually, you know what? We'd be better off coming back in a little bit of time, having a gap and saying, let's just basically fail, fail anything that comes in for the next two or three seconds, and then we'll start trying again. That's what a circuit breaker does for you. A circuit breaker essentially says, the com I, I've seen a number of errors from the component that I'm talking to, um, and because I've seen that number of errors, I think that component is faulty. As a result, what I want to do is stop sending it requests to give it a chance to recover or give the ops team a chance to recover that item. So I'm now going to do what's called breaking the circuit. So obviously, you know, it refers to kind of the electrical concept. Right. We'll, we'll, we'll play balls in a second. but. Um, Generally, we think of three states for a circuit breaker, open, closed, or half open, right? When a circuit breaker is closed, that's kind of normal operation. Traffic goes through uh, the circuit, okay? When it's open, we stop traffic going through the circuit. When we're half open, what we're doing is we're saying, hmm, maybe it's fixed on the other side now. I will push through a test request. If that generates no errors, I will then close the circuit and allow traffic through as normal. If that breaks the circuit, uh, if that if fails, I will then break the circuit basically and open it again in order to prevent traffic going through. 
right? So the idea is to give breathing space to the component that's potentially under load or suffering by essentially breaking the circuit. And normally speaking, what you would do if you have, when you have a circuit breaker trigger is you push back some kind of error to tell this side that basically the circuit is broken. And then it knows essentially to tell basically clients to back off, serve results from cache to the user and otherwise cope, right? So this particular circuit breakers uh, became quite famous because Netflix's Hystrix library, which is what it uses essentially to, to, behind its API, um, uh, provides the circuit breaker capability for you. And that will essentially, when, when their circuit breaker triggers at Netflix, this serves results basically from cache. And what they do is they record um, calls uh, into here and they record essentially the parameters on the call and then what they do is they say, if someone else is making the same call with the same parameters, I will simply serve the cached result set from what I got last time in that particular circumstance, right? So it's a way of dealing with caching. Okay. I won't make you stand up and do circuit breaker because um, it's a bit like retry, only effectively uh, we do a half open, half close state. All right? Yep. Nope. Um, so it's a way of us essentially preventing us from locking up resources when there's a long outage period on some kind of component or fault in our system. A couple of indications. Okay. Um, so we may find that our inbound traffic to, for example, our API um, become sufficiently great that when we're that, that one of our components begins to think about failing. So let's say our microservice really can't cope with a number of requests. It's doing some complex work. Perhaps it's basically stressing the CPU a lot. And the rate of requests coming in over HTTP API is too great for it. Okay. In that circumstance, essentially the problem will be that I will fail here. What example have I actually got here? Um, Right, so I've got a DB connection pool exhausted by long-running queries again. Okay, fault, and we've seen that scenario before. So what I can do to alleviate this problem is introduce messaging. So if I introduce a message broker or some other queuing system, I could use something like zero MQ to be fair. Or, um, if I choose, use messaging between my HTTP a API and my backend service, then effectively I can use messaging to throttle. And what happens is, is that messages that come in here, I acknowledge them and put them on a queue. I go back to the user and say, I've received your request. I'll probably be 202 accepted. And say, I've received your request. And I may give them a link to say, go to this link, here's part of that 202 accepted, and you can see completion of your, your request there. Okay. And then generally what happens is on that uh, link I give you, there's some kind of monitoring endpoint which says, are you done yet? And that may even redirect when it's finished to the actual resource that you were looking to basically deal with, right? And this message queue essentially has basically guaranteed delivery, right? So that means essentially when I put a message from here onto here, it's basically, I know that it's gonna be delivered at some point. In other words, it's basically a durable queue and it's persistent. So at some point, the message will be delivered. And this backend service then consumes at whatever rate it feels it can handle. Okay. So if suddenly I get a surge of traffic, what happens is my queue just builds up and I process things a bit slower. The consequence is of course that you are effectively suffering from eventual consistency because the, the user may effectively have got a response back saying, yes, that's all very good, et cetera, but it may take a while before those things feed through. One trick sometimes is people actually at the front end treat things as though they've succeeded and let the user move on, even though the back end hasn't succeeded because they just changed their local state on the front end. But this service on the back end is able to basically throttle. So it's a, this is a, a, an alternative to introducing huge amounts of new capacity here, right? What I can actually do is say, you know what, I'm just going to use the queue to throttle my traffic. All right. Let me demonstrate this one. Let's have you three again from this end. Come on, out you come. All right. This one is very easy to demonstrate. So we'll just throw the ball once up and down just so to get you warmed up. Right, here's what we're going to do. 
you are now basically going to have a message queue at your input. So you, I just use the easy thing is just use your T-shirt. As the balls come to you, just shove them in your T-shirt. All you do, database, is casually, whenever you feel like, you can just take one, work on it, and then pass it back up the line. Right? No <laughs> rush. You're in no hurry. You know. He stores that essentially, storing it in his queue. And they, whenever the database feels like it, the database can pull one out, deal with the work in a leisurely fashion, and when he's done, uh, pass it back up the line. Right? You are your guaranteed delivery. Don't be dropping him on the floor. Okay, great. And you can see essentially what we've done is we've really alleviated the pressure on the database at the back end by using a queue. Thanks very much, gentlemen. Um, so yeah, so effectively, if you if you worried about basically experiencing load, one way of dealing with load is essentially to have decoupled invocation. Decoupled invocation just means essentially I put work on what's quite often called a task queue and get a back end worker process. So this is when people start to talk about web processes or worker processes, talk about dividing between the thing that's actually receiving the request and doing work at the back end. It does require you to effectively be able to support um, asynchronous working, right? Some of the fire and forget or essentially a response occurring later out of time. Um, interestingly, as in a kind of aside, um, there's an interesting white paper, which I, I, I can't tell you where it is at the minute, but um, some academics looked at uh, the kind of uh, event uh, reactor pattern, which essentially is what Node.js is, where effectively it says in the event that you're IO bound, yield control back to the CPU, which will carry on with the next piece of work, et cetera, right? And they looked at that and compared it to the proactive pattern, which says, actually, I've got multiple threads. I'm not, you know, the V8 runtime. Uh, and so the multiple threads will just pull. So you still, when you're IO, you hand your thread back, but then you've got multiple threads processing the new incoming work from the pool. And when, they've, when, they, when they yield, they just hand that thread back to the pool for another piece of work. And then they looked at basically using task queues, which essentially is, when the work comes in, I put it on a message queue and the back end worker process handles it later. And they have essentially said task queues are always more efficient and easier to, easier to develop than the first two options. Okay. Competing consumers. Um, so one of the problems, of course, decoupled invocation is I'm going to be moving at a rate which is fast enough for my end users. Um, so how do I actually use this pattern but go faster? Okay. And the simple answer is I introduce multiple consumers into that queue. And this is essentially where we would start to talk about being elastic, right? As my queue builds up, I effectively can introduce new consumers which reach from the queue. My queue has to support the idea of multiple readers and handing out new pe different pieces of work to each consumer, but most modern ones like either MQ, for example, do. And I simply get those additional consumers to all basically start processing work. Okay. So, similar scenario, basically. Um, in this particular case, there's one uh, uh, piece of information we need to clear up. In the previous one, the problem was our database is under too much load, right? In this particular area, probably your problem is that an individual CPU is under too much load. If a database basically is going to struggle, it's probably not going to help you to introduce additional consumers because you're simply going to put more load in the database. So your scenario here is much more likely that you are bound by the CPU on this particular step. So for example, we use this for doing things like processing video, where essentially you're quite often CPU bound. All right. And you can see here, effectively I've got my HTTP service, but now I've got effectively three instances of the microservice. And those three instances, essentially, when they're running, all can see messages from the same queue and effectively divide the work between them. And that means, essentially, that I can actually then scale. Yes? I have an example that actually works with a database overload. Yeah, sure. Um, it's not, not if your database suffers from not being able to print the thread, but your database collapses. Right, so yeah. It's not really lower, it's quite elastic because that's one consumer is typically on the work fast enough. So if I introduce these six consumers, they fight elasticity because the, the command line is still strong. Yeah, and particularly if they're actually, they're not trying to process the same rows, they can all effectively work on different rows. Well, they, yeah, so they can so parallelize the operation. Yeah, yeah, we use that in 
Um, let's have you three again, because we can just run that, that particular scenario again very quickly. Come on. Um, because you know what you're doing. And we're going to have this gentleman here is going to join them to be our competing consumer. So same scenario again, I'll pass the ball to you, you store them, but just the two of you can both pick out of his queue, right? So it's very simple. So he's a guaranteed delivery queue, remember that. Uh, all right, there you go. So these guys can essentially just pick stuff out, and when they're done, they just throw it back, right? You may not be able to catch them, you haven't got enough hands, but you can put it back in his, in his queue, yeah, right, exactly. All right, thanks very much, guys. So it's very, it's very simple, right? You guys are much, much better at throwing balls than some of my normal audience who tend to drop them. I'm quite glad because there is an open window and I was a bit concerned that balls might be flying out the open window. And I'd be seen tonight from a Norwegian jail cell while I tried to explain my behavior. Okay. So um, increase the number of consumers. Uh, this is interesting, right? Sometimes it's really important that the items on your queue are processed in order. In that case, avoid using competing consumers. So if you have a queue where you need to process things in order, one of the ways you can you may better rely on the queue's ordering. Um, but that depends really on your ability to guarantee that the sender has sent things in order. But if the sender's got multiple threads, what you do to deal with that essentially is you can put uh, you can put sequence numbers on the items in the queue, and you can simply say if an item comes in out of sequence, I will requeue it and I'll deal with that one later. And that kind of works okay. But if you have multiple consumers, what tends to happen is that they behave very negatively because the first consumer gets to item one, second consumer gets to item two, and says item one's not been processed yet, puts it at the back of the queue. Um, the third cons the sec first consumer then says, well, where's item three? But where was item two? That hasn't been processed yet, right? And they reorder the queue very negatively, and actually things perform worse. So in that case, only really have one consumer. You can have a hot standby if you're concerned about basically fault tolerance. And, fault and generally in failure, one of anything is bad. So you, what you tend to want is a second consumer to run that essentially says, I don't do anything, I just ask the other guy whether he's running, and if he's not running, I take over. Okay. I think uh, getting the thing intensely to use the request can help. I think you said that. Yes, that is true. Rather than you have to repeat the queue in order, you can like do, do different things, like same thing for different queues and then do that. Right, exactly. An event store, for example, um, Greg Young's product essentially is built to support um, uh, competing consumers by partitioning effectively the data so that essentially they get different subsets of the data. That's quite useful. Okay. Parallel pipelines. Don't worry, might make, might make you stand up for this. It always ends in confusion. Um, <laughs> parallel pipelines. So what, so what do parallel pipelines say? Well, sometimes... Um, uh, an individual consumer can take a really long time to process a given task. And what happens as a result of that is the queue can back up. So we see this a little bit when we're doing something like processing video or doing file conversion between formats. And you know everyone's sending us files which are basically you know below a megabyte in size. And then somebody sends us one that is basically half a gig, right? And when we're processing that one, it takes quite a long period of time. And then what happens is everything else in the queue is backing up behind it. Now, competing consumers can help alleviate that because a new consumer starts basically uh, taking something off the queue because uh, and that and freeing up basically other items. But even then, what happens is you know you get another item and you block that consumer. So you then keep basically pulling out consumers to deal with the blockage. So there's a kind of a bit of a simpler model than this, right? So um, uh, you can actually say, well, what I want to do is parallelize the work. So here's what happens. When I make a request to my backend service, I start running a pipeline. And that pipeline has a data source and a data sync or pipeline key. Data source says, right, the work that c has come in, I want to effectively divide that up into individual pieces that I can then do in parallel. And at the end, I will essentially collate the pieces and effectively respond with the work, right? So essentially, this is a kind of map reduce problem, right? And so each one of these particular items effectively says, I am a basically a service. I basically read, well, I, I, I receive one of these pieces of work. Now, you could make the calls directly, but generally what happens is you basically put, you have a message queue up and down the pipeline. And essentially you say, well, I've got a queue to here, a queue to here, a queue to here, and they all feed back into here, right, when they're done. 
and each one of these items is then able to run and deal with work. Now, what you'll find is then the usually the you get smaller items running very quickly and you'll keep processing parts of the work. So your your speed is now governed by the slowest step. Okay. So you can never get faster than your slowest step, but because you're processing everything else in parallel, which it takes less time than the slowest step, you can reduce the overall time taken to complete the work. So imagine that my overall time was, say for example, 10 seconds. Okay. And these steps all took one second, but this step took six seconds. Under the old model, we had previously back uh, up here, is that a broker? Uh, go back, go back. Um, we'd find that, that took, si took 10 seconds, right? Because essentially each one of these is processing a whole job, right? Whereas if we go back here, we'll obviously find that it takes six seconds because we now run at the speed of the slowest item in the work. So we can improve the performance of something that essentially is a problem for us by effectively distributing the work to a range of consumers that handle subparts of the process. And essentially the data source basically pushes them down basically via pipelines to each of these items and then basically collate them at the far end. So it's this map reduce model, right? Make sense? Essentially, we therefore basically are only governed by the slowest part of the process, not by the other bits. Okay. So that's essentially what we're doing. Uh, yeah. So you can generally find these bottlenecks basically in some of these steps by effectively doing monitoring to see which ones are the actual slowest items that you've got. Okay. Cool. Right. Okay. Um, so that's it for me for the patterns list. What else should you read if you're interested in this topic? Okay. The kind of the key book is this one. Has anyone actually read this book here? All right. I urge you to go and read this book. This book is the worst named book ever, right? Because this book has absolutely nothing to do with releasing software. So I do not know why they ever chose to call it Release It. it that makes no sense to me. This book is essentially, by, by Michael Nygaard, it is the major source of availability patterns. And it's basically like a war story as it starts out the first half. He ran some exceptionally high volume e-commerce sites and about how they found, diagnosed and fixed problems in them. And then a series of patterns and practices to use basically in building sites. So the popularity of things like retry circuit breaker, et cetera, come from this book, which is the original source where people picked it all up from. Um, and I, I cannot recommend this book highly enough if you want to essentially deal with it. There are a lot more patterns than the ones I've discussed here. I've kind of picked out some highlights, but there's a whole range of patterns and there's a whole range of effectively smells to look at uh, to see whether or not your system basically is lacking availability, what the causes are, are basically problems commonly. Who just said there's a fault, it talks a lot about what kind of faults you experience, what the causes are, and that kind of thing. So I re really recommend reading that book. Um, this book's probably still one of the best books I think about patterns to use if you're doing SOA and by extension nowadays kind of microservices, right? And that gives you a range of patterns to deal with basically. So stuff around decoupled invocation, et cetera, some of that stuff you'll, you'll find governed in here. But generally if you're building microservices at all, I recommend reading this book. It's very, very useful for understanding how we build these things properly. Okay. Um, if any of you don't like developers? Okay, so I work in a library called Brighter. We just got our non-beta non version of our .NET Core version right now. So basically, we're a CQRS framework, but we also do task keys. So we basically give you the ability to pass a command over a queue. So we do decoupled invocation for you, right? And we can be used in microservice environments. We basically integrate with a library called Poly. Who's heard of Poly? Okay, so Poly is a .NET library which essentially does support retry, circuit breaker, timeout, and various patterns like that. So we integrate with that and basically let you control your pipelines for handling requests using poly policy. Right? And so you may find that helpful if you're interested in this kind of stuff and going home and looking at what we do. All right, summary of what we talked about. So we basically talked about what failure was. Okay, so failure to deviation in systems and classification. And then we said essentially that faults will happen. We expect, we should, we should never expect to be able to ship a perfect system. We're gonna ship something that's faulty. Um, we said that the very basic pattern we should always basically remember is that when we make a call between two processes, 
we should time out and we should not wait for all eternity because essentially that causes chain failure. We said that we may want to retry. We think the error basically that we are going to experience is potentially transient and more clear. And we said, if we think the error that we're receiving indicates a long outage, we should break the circuit, serve results from cache, not put additional load in the failing component. We said that in the event that we're experiencing problems with load, we can manage that load ourselves by queuing through decoupled invocation. And then if we need to speed up the processing of those items under load, we can effectively use um, competing consumers as a pattern, right? So we, we have some elastic scaling uh, involved and we can monitor these things like monitor queue lengths and introduce new consumers. And if essentially the problem is that in our pipeline we have uh, the, the too long, it takes too long to process the work, consider splitting up that work into a number of pieces and processing it in parallel so that we basically only take as long as the basically the constraining element in the pipeline. All right. Questions? Have we got any questions? The Bright is built over RabbitMQ, and we also, in theory, support Azure and AWS, though our support is more patchy because we've had to rewrite since um, .NET Core conversion because both of them had different libraries. I think the Azure stuff might be working and the AWS stuff needs us to, to address it um, because uh, in the .NET Core uh, timeline, Azure's essentially we're, we're using a third-party lib and some REST stuff, uh, and AWS changed their libraries, so we're not sure about those two, but the RabbitMQ stuff works. Um, we have a kind of, if you like, a plug-in model for different providers, so you can write new ones if you want to. Um, we may tackle, or I may tackle, because I think it's falling to me that one in a minute, um, doing it over basically Redis. Um, and I think another group of guys in, in Holland were talking about building one over a SQL database, God bless them, um, because they can't get anyone to give them a... Uh, access to the, um, uh, the the bus inside the enterprise, um, so they're basically having to use database which they can get access to. Um, but yeah, so, we, so if you're using RabbitMQ, we are a very good solution, and we 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 um, we know it's accept we know we we deal with very high volume, and we're we're very reliable. So we build a lot of reliability over it for you. So the model we have essentially is that you create a command, and you essentially do send if you want to basically target one handler, publish to many in process but you do post if you want to basically target uh, a handler out of process. And essentially, but it looks the same. So the handler and the, it looks the same wherever you deploy it. And then all you have to do is add a configuration. And the configuration essentially uh, inside, what we, inside your service that basically is consuming from the queue, just looking at configuration and saying, essentially a routine table saying, what messages do I subscribe to and what handlers do they go to? And then we handle the whole thing synchronously for you. So all you have to do is write your handlers. You don't have to deal with any of the, the infrastructure concerns. Mass transit, you know, does it, is, is, is very similar, and service buses has is, is similar as well. They all do, we all do a similar job. We just have slightly different opinions on how to do that job, but they're all equally valid, valid, valid ways of doing it. Um. Yeah, so what we actually do is we, and Bright just gives you the option to have a message store. That the sender effectively puts the work in the message store, and we recommend generally that you are muted, that your message is very potent, and then you just resend from the store if a message go, messages go missing. So we handle that. The only way you can detect that, though, essentially, is if effectively your uh, system is no longer in a way you expect it to be in terms of state. So we don't have any auto detection to check there's no delivery between the exchange and the actual queue. Um, uh, it is what it is, right? Um, but we provide an additional level of safety, which says when you send the message, we will put it in. You can put it in the message store. We don't do a transaction um, to do that. We essentially uh, recommend probably get generally you do that in two steps, and we've actually stores the, the message to the message store, and then we kind of send it. So that effectively, in the event that you fail at any one step, you can usually recover. 
um, back to a, back to pushing something out of the message stream. Sounds like balancing. Yeah, essentially a number of us do the same thing. Yeah. We also let you do a, what's called a, we do a, a command sourcing option as opposed to event sourcing and let you store incoming messages basically on another side to say, what did I receive? Um, so you can support that kind of Fowler-esque version of event sourcing as well. Um, but yeah, we just have a message stream and say, be item potent. So you can resend stuff that went missing somewhere in the deep dark, so de depth of rabbit. We, 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 d we tend to not use, um, uh, we don't tend to, as a result, use messages that basically are persistent. And we also don't really quite often, that often use durable queues. Um, we uh, tend to have our consumers create queues when they start up. Uh, and we just, as a practice, don't tend to, uh, if we're basically having to do something which involves shutting down the exchange, um, we would tend to essentially make sure that we start and stop things in the right order so that the, the consumers start operating before the exchange comes up. Then we have a lot of retry logic, which essentially sits there waiting for the exchange to come online and then connect to it. As a side effect, that really helps us with in Docker scenarios because when you use containers, what we discovered quite early on was that if you basically have a container with Rabbit, even though the container spins up, Rabbit itself was not basically started yet. And so when in your Docker compose file, you're saying, hey, I'm dependent on the rabbit on the broker, it just waits for the container to start. It doesn't actually know if rabbit started, right? And so the result of that is that you quite often find people talking about saying, oh, my containers tried to talk to the broker, but the broker's not there and it's failed. We just, we just basically retry when the event that happens after an interval. Um, so we try and get around some of the um, uh, limitations of the queue. You do. I mean, the advantage of basically using somebody else's library that wraps all that is essentially that complexity then goes away from you, right? I mean, on the Python side, we quite often use Combi, which essentially does all of that work for you anyway, right? Um, <coughs> but generally, when you're talking to message queues, there is a lot of this try and make it reliable issue going on. Um, that even, you know, uh, just just an issue. I mean, any, anything where you have the pattern where essentially you are a um, what's called a dynamic recipient list. And that means that the broker subscribers basically are dynamic. In other words, basically they at runtime appear and say, I want to be a part of the recipient list. In other words, basically I subscribe to that particular set of notifications has the risk that effectively you, a given consumer won't receive a message. And that's why we basically let you resend because that's the easiest solution to the problem is to basically make sure that you capture the outgoing traffic so that you can just resend it. Um, and that gets over any problem that with that kind of ordering and reliability. Uh, are you clustering or? Rabbit. Yeah, right on Reddit. Yeah, a rabbit. Yeah, yeah. So, I, I think, I mean, that's usually okay. But I think you get more issues actually with the cluster sometimes uh, in terms of basically yeah. lost stuff. Sorry. Yeah, and that's when you tend to lose messages usually. Uh, yeah, I think some people do right. Um, bizarrely, uh, you may be better off effectively, you know, just going back to the one instance, but that's a weird thing. Um, I, 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 I don't necessarily know anything that's, that's ultimately better. They all have their weaknesses. Um, whose blog is it? I can't remember now. Hmm? Whose blog is the one basically whose, whose closure strips basically, uh, begins with a AFA, AFA's blog, essentially, if I, uh, if anything with AFA's blog. AFA basically is quite a distributed system guy, and essentially goes around testing distributed databases and queuing systems and breaking them uh, in interesting ways, and essentially proving that many of them violate the, the guarantees that they give. So if something is guaranteeing to be available in partition torrent, you know, most of you remember the CAP theorem, right? So CAP theorem says consistency, availability, and partition tolerance, you should choose two. Although Brewer disputes, he says that, right? There's a paper called 12 years later um, where he says, actually, I didn't quite say what people think I meant, I said, but um, 
And so if I, what APA has uh, been proving is that some people basically say we're available and partition tolerant, and quite often they're not as partition tolerant as they claim. Um, uh, there's a lot of, cap theorems are interesting, there's a lot of nonsense talked about cap theorem. For example, you can, people say, oh, you can't choose consistency and availability, all right, um, at the same time. Uh, you can, right, it, but basically what that means is essentially that you're probably saying, I've got my SQL database running in the data center, uh, and I don't have effectively the ability to cope with essentially a partition because actually all of my kit runs in the same rack in the data center, so I believe that a partition is very unlikely unless the rack is caught fire. If the rack is caught fire, my trouble, my, the, the partition tolerance is probably the least of my problems at this point in time, right? And so uh, that's an example Baruch basically uses. So he says, um, you know, you've got to be wary of your circumstance, right? And then yes, in a cloud environment, you do need to be partition tolerant because, you've, because you're not on a rack. You've got no guarantee, you know, where the two machines are and one of them may well fail. But in a data center, maybe you don't have to be. And he actually, what he wanted people was to solve the problem, not just declare. It, when he wrote the original paper, his idea was people will solve this problem uh, rather than uh, people will just give up. <laughs> uh, but there you go. So I, I, if you've read Captain, I definitely I recommend going and reading his paper 12 years later, uh, which is very, it's a very interesting read about what he genuinely thinks about the Captain and problem and the way that it's been used by in, in industry, basically, post that. Anything else? warm so I don't know whether you necessarily want to sit and stare at me for much longer <laughs> okay All right, thank you. probably is we, we